Hello all, I'm Timothy Jackson and I teach ethics in the Department of Religious Studies here at Stanford. I'm the moderator for the debate tonight, the debate sponsored by Table Talk, who I thank. On the topic of evolution, science, or dogma, and let me first say a few words about the format, then I'll introduce our speakers. There will be two opening statements, each of 25 minutes, and then two rebuttal periods, each of 10 minutes. After that, we'll open it up to the floor for questions. If you have a question, proceed, if you will, to one of the mics in either aisle, and I'll acknowledge you and then try to direct it to the party most relevant to that question. Our speakers tonight are first to my left, Professor William Provine, who is a professor of the history of the philosophy of science and the biological sciences at Cornell. And to my right is Professor Philip Johnson, who's a professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley, written on criminal law. And uh, <laughs> no hissing, please. But, uh, and also the author of the book Darwin on trial. We'll begin first with Professor Johnson. I think, uh, I think they'll be moving a few things as I start. Don't let that distract you, and it won't distract me. This is, I think, the fourth time that Will Provine and I have met in debate, uh, the other three times being uh, at Cornell University, uh, two of them in front of his class in evolutionary biology. Uh, so I feel qualified to say where we will tend to agree and where we'll tend to disagree during this debate. First, where we agree. Uh, will Provine and I agree that the modern neo-Darwinian theory of evolution is fundamentally inconsistent with any meaningful theism, with any meaningful uh, God who acts as a creator of the world. Now, of course, this isn't necessarily true of uh, all theories of evolution or of the concept of evolution broadly construed, because uh, a creator God could make use of a gradual, long-term process of making one thing out of another just as well as any other process. So there's nothing about the word evolution that rules out the creator. But the modern neo-Darwinian theory of evolution, that is to say the orthodox view among today's scientists, insists that evolution is an unplanned, undirected process. It combines elements of chance and necessity, or natural law, that is to say a combination of random genetic changes or mutations which are accumulated through natural selection. Uh, these are impersonal material forces reflecting no pre-existing intelligence and no guidance so that human beings as the outcome of this process are essentially an unplanned accident of nature. Now it's evolution in that sense that we're talking about and evolution as a comprehensive theory of the history of life, of how we and other living things came into existence. The implication of evolutionary biology in that, that sense is perhaps not exactly that God does not exist. It would be more accurate to say that if God does exist, existing is about the only thing that God has ever done. Uh, God is permanently unemployed, has never found useful employment in the entire history of life because impersonal material forces were capable of doing the whole job and did do it. Uh, so if one attempts to hold a view of God as creator, uh, it is a very attenuated view and one which tends to uh, fade away into unreality. Now I would agree with Will Provine on this, but I would tend to stress more than the conclusions of evolutionary biology that a theistic picture of the world is fundamentally inconsistent with the manner of thinking that evolutionary biologists have employed to reach their conclusions. That is to say, contemporary evolutionary biology, like much else in science, is based on the premise that nature is all there is. It is based on a premise of metaphysical naturalism. One assumes that at the beginning uh, there was nothing but matter in mindless motion. It follows from this starting point assumption 
that impersonal, unintelligent, purposeless forces must have been capable of doing all the work of creation because there wasn't anything else. Purpose and intelligence could not come into existence on the basis of these assumptions until they evolved through unintelligent and purposeless processes. Now, this way of thinking is said to uh, generate reliable conclusions, conclusions which we can label as scientific knowledge and make very strong statements such as that evolution in this sense, fully naturalistic evolution, is a fact. Now, if that's the way to get to correct conclusions about reality, it would seem likely that the premises on which those conclusions are based are true. Uh, so if someone says, well, I'm going to apply completely naturalistic thinking of that kind, I'm going to assume that there was no creator around at the beginning, so purposeless material forces had to do everything, um, and then says, and now that I've decided that mutation and selection did the job, I'm going to turn around and baptize them as God's way of creating. Uh, this person is not thinking logically. Uh, they're putting in at the end of the process uh, what was removed at the beginning. On the other hand, if a person starts with the assumption that God exists, that is, a creator exists, who might employ a process of evolution, naturalistic or otherwise, uh, but might do something else, um, then we do not start out with a certainty that uh, an explanation of the origin of life and its growth to its present enormous complexity and diversity is possible on the basis of purely naturalistic, materialistic, and purposeless forces. In short, the theist in that sense, I'll say the theistic realist, wants to know, is what you are telling us true? And will not be satisfied to be told, well, the mutation selection story, the neo-Darwinian story, is the best naturalistic story we can tell, and therefore it's science. That's not good enough. Now, to illustrate the kind of difference that it makes if you ask, is naturalistic evolution true at all, I want to show you an example uh, from the California Academies of Sciences Museum in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, the exhibit uh, Life Through Time, the Case for Evolution. Could I have the first slide now, please? In that exhibit, which you can go to in Golden Gate Park, and I encourage you to do so, particularly after you've uh, seen these slides, um, you can see uh, the centerpiece there is called the Hard Facts Wall. Now, what the hard facts wall is representing is the Cambrian explosion, which is to say the sudden appearance of the animal phyla in the rocks of the Cambrian uh, era, some 600 million years ago, uh, give or take a bit. Um, now, this is well known to be one of the great mysteries of the history of life. Richard Dawkins, the uh, complete uh, uh, Darwinist uh, uh, a propagator uh, says that they are, the, the phyla are planted there in the Cambrian rocks as if they had no evolutionary history at all. Now, this is reflected here um, by, the, uh, we're going to go to a diagram in a moment because the photograph is a little hard to see, but you see that the fossils, these each represent a phylum, one of the major divisions of the animal world, and the fossils are all on parallel lines. You see, the lines don't meet where the fossils are. But below the lines, you can see that they're connected by lines with no fossils on them. And the connecting points, each one of them has a magnifying glass over it. Now, in other parts of the exhibit, magnifying glasses are, are used to show you little fossils, you know, things that you have a hard time seeing without the glasses. So the, the sort of the implication here is if you strained your eyes enough and looked through those glasses, you would see the common ancestors which connect to these otherwise disparate phyla. Now, as I say, since the photograph's a little hard to see, we have a diagrammatic representation of it. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, now, now, this is a diagrammatic uh, representation, and here you can read the names of the, of the phyla. We have the vertebrates the, uh, on one end, the corals on the other. Just a few of the Cambrian era phyla, uh, with the lines going down to um, uh, where the earliest fossils are found. And again, you see that they are on parallel lines. There's no evidence uh, from the fossils of a pattern.